Amazingly, 50s America had moved little beyond the days of Jim Crow. Particularly in the South, life among blacks and whites remained separate and unequal. There was no way you could be black in this country and not be affected by it. Here I was selling millions of records around the world, hero everywhere, and I couldn't get a hot dog in Baltimore unless it went to the back door. It wasn't right, but that's just how it was. That was just life. On December the 1st, 1955, on a public bus in Montgomery, Alabama, life began to change. By refusing to give up her seat to a white man, a tired seamstress named Rosa Parks quietly ignited a revolution. The day that Rosa Parks was arrested, a low murmur went through the whole city. And overnight, this thing bloomed. Led by a charismatic young preacher named Martin Luther King, the city's black community organized a peaceful boycott of the buses. They walked instead. We will do it in an orderly fashion. This is a non-violent protest. We are depending on moral and spiritual forces. White policemen responded by arresting black carpool drivers. White extremists bombed King's home. Martin always said, you know, if you don't have anything that you die for, what do you have to live for? Nobody thought we could stay off the buses. None of those people wanted to lose their jobs. But Martin Luther had instilled in them so rightly that we must all make a sacrifice that the buses continue to run empty. They did for 381 days. On November the 13th, 1956, the Supreme Court ordered the buses desegregated. Martin Luther King was now the undisputed leader of the civil rights movement. The colored population idolized. Martin Luther. We are not going back to the buses bragging about a victory. People experienced the self-esteem that they had never experienced before. Be and they and had been given for the last 12 months. a light, a beacon at the end of the tunnel. That light reached Melba Beals, a 15-year-old high school student in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was very conscious of what was going on and wanting it to wash over me and wash over Little Rock. It was about to. In 1954, the Supreme Court had ordered the integration of all public schools in its famous decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. Three years later, that decision would be severely tested at Little Rock's all-white Central High School. Despite the federal court order, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus had no intention of allowing black students to attend Central High, and he ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school. On September the 3rd, Melba Beals and eight other black students walked towards Central High. One, Elizabeth Eckford, became separated from her friends and was surrounded by a white mob that included Ann Thompson. There was just a lot of electricity in the air. It, it was almost a circus-like atmosphere. All these parents on the sideline urging us on and telling us, you know, get out there, don't let them get in. There are uh, mobs on her heels, you know, like dogs, nipping at her. Policemen are watching this. Every time she tries to step between them, they close ranks on her. If Central High was to be integrated, it would have to be by order of the president. Eisenhower was at first reluctant to interfere. His record on civil rights was not a good one until 1957, in the crisis at Little Rock. And there, a fundamental question 
was dealt with. Do the states have the right to impose their own social order in defiance of federal court orders? Eisenhower answered decisively, said no. We have made a national commitment. We are going to desegregate this society. And if it takes the 101st Airborne to do it, so be it. It was, I mean, it, that, that is vivid still. You know, I could just see Little Rock just being in a state of siege by the, by the troops, you know. That was real fear. Three weeks after the Little Rock Nine were turned away from Central High, they returned, accompanied by troops of the 101st Airborne. We're all in an army station wagon, uh, machine gun mounts. It's a pretty heady day. Uh, it's not what uh, everybody gets to go to school. You got a thousand paratroopers, you got helicopters, jeeps in front, jeeps behind. And we stepped out of the jeep into this uh, square of soldiers who were serious. You know, as I walked up the steps that day at Central High School, I can remember the click of the leather boots on those stairs. And I remember being so impressed by who they were. You know, these are Americans. I'm an American. And so the first time I get the feeling that there is hope, that there is a reason I salute the flag, that this is what America is about. I felt that Little Rock would never be the same again. We would never know life as we'd known it again because nine people walked into a school building. My teenage models had been the kids who danced on American Bandstand. And all of a sudden had come the Little Rock Nine. And I can remember having the feeling that they've been tied and, and tested and they've survived. Someday, in some way, I'm going to be tested this way too. Uh, so I think when the movement comes along in the 1960s, I'm ready for it. At the lunch counter in this Greensboro, North Carolina Woolworths, in February of 1960, four college freshmen took a stand by simply sitting down. The day that we, we decided to sit down, we figured we could go to jail. If that was what we faced, then, then it was worth doing that. By asking for a cup of coffee and a donut, Joe McNeil and his friends had taken on segregation, an established way of life in the American South, one which would not allow blacks to eat with whites at a lunch counter or use the same restrooms or drink from the same water fountains. There comes a time in life where you say, hey, we're going to confront it and see where it goes. Within weeks of the Greensboro sit-in, similar protests were breaking out in more than 30 southern cities. There was a astounding, rapid ripple effect because every time you turned on the radio or TV, there was another sit-in someplace. And all of the people sitting in were young. We had crossed the line. I was no longer afraid of being arrested than afraid to go to jail. The first time I got arrested, I tell you, I was free. I was liberated. Young people getting arrested on purpose so they could be free. They touched the conscience of America. As we began to see what was coming out of the South, we knew that there was something wrong in this country. And I think that that had a powerful effect on us. The effect was 
to believe that it was possible to make change in the world and that you had a responsibility to take part in that change. In 1961, the author James Baldwin wrote, To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage all the time. It was two worlds, a black world and a white world. As a young child, I remember very well seeing the signs, and, and I resented it. If you went to the Dairy Queen, white people would go in and sit down. You got your ice cream at a window. I never rode a bus because I knew I'd have to sit in the back. I uh, didn't go downtown to the movie theaters because I'd have to sit in the Jim Crow gallery. I, I remember on one occasion I tried to go to the county library, and we couldn't even go in and check out of a book. That did not change until the Civil Rights Movement. In the early 1960s, young people would take the lead in the battle for racial equality. Federal courts had ruled that segregated waiting areas in bus stations were illegal. But the law was not being enforced. To pressure the Kennedy administration to intervene, activists rode public buses into the Deep South to integrate the facilities. Outside of Anniston, Alabama, the bus carrying the first group of self-proclaimed Freedom Riders was firebombed. By the time the Freedom Ride started, there was a realization that some of us would have to die. And that we should not fear death. And we liken this very much to military service. That if you serve your country in the military, you might lose your life. We were serving our country at home. We knew that this was a very dangerous mission, but we felt we had a moral obligation uh, and a mandate to, to make this trip. John Lewis, then a student leader, was a freedom rider on a bus that arrived in Montgomery, Alabama. The very moment we started down the steps, a mob out of nowhere, people by the hundreds, came out with baseball bats, stones, chains and start beating us. I was hit in the head with a wooden crate. I was left lying unconscious in a pool of blood. I thought I was going to die. Many of the young people in the Civil Rights Movement united in an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. SNCC is special because we are young. We're 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. Most of us have dropped out of school, so we're no longer students, but we don't have mortgages, we don't have car payments, we don't have families, we don't have husbands and wives and children. So we can do these things. And because we're young, we're also foolish, and we're willing to take risk. We wanted to create a mass movement. We wanted to get hundreds and thousands of people involved. We had been talking about developing a, a nonviolent army that would be prepared to go into a community, be arrested, court arrest, and so forth, break down that fear of jail as a weapon, and also break down the infrastructure of the local area by filling up their jails. All right, let's stop it right here. It was a tactic that SNCC took to Albany, Georgia. Anybody who found the courage to be involved could be involved. In the first weeks of the Albany campaign, more than 500 young people were arrested. Once you get in jail, it's a sobering experience. Because jail is not like a rally. And jail is not like a march. Some people would get into jail, they would clang those doors, and they would actually cry. And then there would be people who felt that we're in jail and we need to pray. Then there were teenagers who wanted to do rock and roll or they were talking about their boyfriends. And it was in jail where I began to be asked to sing a lot. And no money to go to bail. Keep your eyes on the prize, oh Lord. 
Paul and Silas began to shout. Jail door open and they walked out. Keep your eyes on. If you're in the movement, all of the singing is one way of being heard and announcing your presence. You can't sing a song without producing power. And you will often see people singing in the face of police. If I sing, you stand in my sound. In Albany, Georgia, we force the jails open by numbers. And they could not stop us from singing and praying. The movement was energized, but the law did not change. The nine-month effort to desegregate Albany, Georgia, failed. The next major campaign was fought on even tougher ground. It was probably the most violent and vicious racist city in the South. There had been 60 bombings of black people's homes in Birmingham in 61 and 62. One target for the movement in Birmingham was to desegregate the schools. Alabama's governor, George Wallace, had promised they would stay white. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Our demonstrations in Birmingham were usually simply marches to the courthouse or to city hall and we almost never got more than two blocks from the church and then we were arrested. Day after day, hundreds of demonstrators filled the Birmingham jails. Among those arrested was the organizer of the Birmingham campaign, the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. By then, he was the acknowledged leader of the entire civil rights movement. My heroes for the second half of the 20th century, Martin Luther King. All of these people are people who accepted the fact that you have to put everything online. Because if you don't, you're not going to get anything. Not in America. Because America is not going to change. Only you can change. As part of the campaign, Dr. King enlisted an army of school children aged 6 to 16. After the first day of demonstrations, Nearly a thousand of them had been herded into police vans and sent to jail. The next day, the police changed their tactics. The law enforcement in Birmingham was headed by one Bull Connor. And Bull Connor was an old-fashioned lock them up, throw them in jail, throw away the key, beat them up, put dogs on them, hose them down with fire hoses. Anything he could think of to try to stop this movement by force, he did. I watched the violence in Birmingham on TV. It shocked me to see the dogs being unleashed on people, and it shamed me. This was the front page of every major newspaper in the world, and it told a story that America was ashamed of. of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. Trying to raise congressional support for the Kennedy Civil Rights Bill, civil rights leaders called for a march on Washington. On August the 28th, 1963, more than 200,000 people showed up. We knew it was a special day. And once I got there and saw the crowds coming from all over America, black and white, poor people, rich people, show business, politicians, Martin called it a coalition of goodwill, or a coalition of conscience that could change the soul of a nation on the race issue. 
This was bringing a mass meeting into the homes of millions of Americans who were seeing this thing that I had seen over and over and over again in small town churches everywhere, seeing this for the first time and hearing the oratory of America's premier orator, Martin Luther King. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I remember thinking when I saw Martin Luther King that he was going in his dream to bring the nation along, that he was irresistible in his call to mercy and love. I mean, that he was absolutely the most irresistible voice that had ever been heard. Freedom and justice, I have a dream. My poor little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. You know, I was a little young. Uh, I do remember it. Martin Luther King was a very powerful effect on me, but it wasn't so much that I understood what he was saying, but I knew that he stood for me, because I needed somebody to stand for me. We will be able to speed up that day when all the thoughts, children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty! We are To me, that day represented one of the finest hours in American history. In the mid-1960s, the determination to challenge traditional boundaries seemed to be growing in almost every arena. Perhaps most striking was a broadening struggle for civil rights, a struggle that many whites now joined in large numbers. In the summer of 1964, hundreds of college students, white and black, headed south to Mississippi, where many blacks were still mired in a Jim Crow world of poverty and political impotence. These students from the North hoped to register black voters and establish so-called freedom schools to teach literacy skills to those who'd been denied them. They were traveling into a world where many people were set in their ways. President Lyndon Johnson warned the students that the federal government could not guarantee their safety. They've received a lot of training to, in order to prepare them for life in Mississippi, which was not going to be very easy. It wasn't easy for us, and we tried to make that very clear to people. I mean, our lives are, on, you know, are in imminent danger every, every minute of the day. When we tr crossed the line into Mississippi, and it said, Mississippi welcomes you, it was the first time I felt really afraid. In the first group to arrive in Mississippi were students Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Within days, all three of them were missing. Bob Moses, who was the head of the Mississippi Summer Project, brought the group together, told us that they were missing, and it was clear to all of us that it was extremely likely that they were dead. Six weeks after their disappearance, the three were discovered buried in an earthen dam, shot in the head. In that summer of 1964, the Ku Klux Klan was still trying to stop the forces of change. But among the students and in the homes and churches of the black community, the feeling grew stronger that change could not be prevented. We went 
up to the home of a very poor black woman, sharecropper shack. She had a bunch of kids. She came to the door. She looked at her feet. She said, yes, I'm no to everything we said. And we tried to persuade her to sign this. And it was very clear she signed it. She might get thrown out of her home. After a few minutes of talking, she suddenly straightened up, looked us in the eyes, and said, I'll sign it. And she signed it. That's how powerful the movement was. Preoccupied as he was with the growing war in Vietnam, President Johnson knew that he had to address problems at home. Despite America's prosperity, 40 million citizens still live below the poverty line. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. In May 1964, the president unveiled the grand plan for what he called the Great Society. Mr. Johnson hoped to match the power and vitality of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal with a list of welfare, job, and educational opportunities to aid underprivileged Americans. But the privilege that many Southern blacks most desired was the right to vote, still often denied them. In Selma, Alabama, 97% of 15,000 eligible black voters were unregistered. Some because of cynicism or apathy, but most because they faced violence and intimidation from local authorities. People could only attempt to register on the first and third Mondays of each month. The water is not in session this afternoon as you went for him. You came down to make a mockery out of and you have to get some white person to vouch that you are a good character. No white person in his right mind in the state of Alabama was going to vouch that a black person was a good character. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? We've come to register... To Selma rapidly became the new flashpoint of the civil rights movement. On March the 7th, 1965, 600 civil rights activists planned a march that was to take them from Selma to the state capitol in Montgomery, some 54 miles away. Their route would take the non-violent demonstrators through what amounted to enemy territory, roads and highways controlled by the Alabama State Police. And they came toward us, beating up with nightsticks, with bull whips, and tramping us with horses. I was hit in the head and just left lying there. And I, I felt like I was, I felt like it was the last protest. The violence and brutality which ended this march quickly provoked plans for a much larger one. Now joined by Dr. Martin Luther King. We've gone too far now to turn back. Dr. King was determined to focus national attention on Selma, and he enlisted the help of supporters from New York to Hollywood. The Reverend said, the white man can't cool it because he's never dug it. Marlon Brando was the one who got me involved in civil rights, honestly. He, uh, uh, I was walking down the street and he just pulled up in the car and he said, uh, how'd you like to go down to Selma? Yeah. I said, Selma, Selma, we're going to have a march from Selma to Montgomery. You want to come? And I said, sure. Before the second march had even begun, the Reverend James Reeb, a civil rights sympathizer, was beaten to death by a white mob. But rather than intimidating the marchers, that violence seemed to give them a powerful ally. That night, I was with Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma when we heard Lyndon Johnson. We watched him make one of the greatest speeches any American president ever made on the whole question of civil rights. Their cause must be our cause too. It's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Just think of 
a president with a southern accent from Texas saying to the Congress of the United States, we shall overcome. Finally, popular protest and public power had come together. And Dr. King literally started crying. Tears came down his face. I knew then that we would make it from Selma to Montgomery. On March 21st, 1965, 3,200 people set out from Selma. Four days later, as the march approached Montgomery, there were 25,000 people marching. It was an amazing moment. It was, it was scary. It was scary. There were helicopters everywhere, like uh, some sort of angry bugs. And there were only Confederate flags flying, and we were the only ones with American flags. Yeah, and Martin Luther King gave a great speech. All the world today knows that we are here and we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama saying we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. That's good. That's good. That's good. There's very few times in your life that you know that you're someplace that you're at a moment where this is one of those things that as long as there's time is going to be this moment. That was it. United States of America. On August the 6th, Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, finally guaranteeing black Americans the right to vote. But just as it reached a high point, the civil rights movement seemed to split into warring factions. A revolution of rising expectations stirs people to believe that the promised land is there. It was when change was coming, when there was a sense of possibility, uh, that everything broke loose. We're in the South, where we had a powerful nonviolent movement. People had a way to channel that frustration. In, in many parts of America, especially outside of the South, the fires of frustration, the fires of discontent, were beginning to burn. In 1967, that anger and discontent exploded into violence. In Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Michigan, and more than a hundred other cities, 80 people died in urban riots that summer. Lyndon Johnson was shocked, I think, at the riots and angry. He took it personally and he got angry at blacks for being ungrateful for how these great laws had been passed. Despite his disappointment, Lyndon Johnson believed that his war on poverty could still succeed. All he needed was more money. Well, the president said to me, you know, we have this uh, war going on now in Vietnam. It's going to take up all of the extra money we have right now uh, to fight that war. But he said, Sarge, look, we're going to be out of that war. We'll, that'll be finished in the next 12 to 18 months. As soon as that's finished, I will take the money we are now are devoting to the war in Vietnam and we'll put it into the war against poverty. Obviously, that never happened. In America, 1968, peace and understanding were fast becoming distant memories. As the Vietnam War became the longest war in American history. Over a hundred college campuses were racked by furious protest. In the spring, many of the nation's cities exploded once again with racial violence, propelled by the terrible events of April the 4th, 1968. When I heard over the news that Martin Luther King had been shot in Memphis, and then seconds later killed in Memphis, it was, as if a member of my family had been killed. And it said to me, here's this guy has been going around preaching peace and nonviolence and peaceful resistance. And now someone has shot him dead. And it shattered my belief that we could work these things out in a peaceful way. It's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. That night, Robert Kennedy, the leading candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination, announced King's death to a room full of campaign workers. In Kennedy, 
many Americans, both black and white, saw a man who could turn back the tide of violence. Two months after the death of Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy was killed. Please be, be seated. Mrs. King, members of the King family, distinguished members of the Congress, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the White House, the home that belongs to all of us, the American people. When I was thinking of the contributions to our country, the man that we're honoring today, a passage attributed to the American poet John Greenleaf Whittier comes to mind. Each crisis brings its word and deed. In America in the 50s and 60s, one of the important crises we faced was racial discrimination. The man whose words and deeds in that crisis stirred our nation to the very depths of its soul was Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Martin Luther King was born in 1929 in an America where, because of the color of their skin, nearly one in ten lived lives that were separate and unequal. Most black Americans were taught in segregated schools. Across the country, too many could find only poor jobs, toiling for low wages. They were refused entry into hotels and restaurants, made to use separate facilities. In a nation that proclaimed liberty and justice for all, too many black Americans were living with neither. In one city, a rule required all blacks to sit in the rear of public buses. But in 1955, when a brave woman named Rosa Parks was told to move to the back of the bus, she said no. A young minister in a local Baptist church, Martin Luther King, then organized a boycott of the bus company, a boycott that stunned the country. Within six months, the courts had ruled the segregation of public transportation unconstitutional. Dr. King had awakened something strong and true, a sense that true justice must be colorblind and that among white and black Americans, as he put it, their destiny is tied up with our destiny and their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom, we cannot walk alone. In the years after the bus boycott, Dr. King made equality of rights his life's work. Across the country, he organized boycotts, rallies, and marches. Often he was beaten, imprisoned, but he never stopped teaching nonviolence. Work with the faith, he told his followers, that unearned suffering is redemptive. In 1964, Dr. King became the youngest man in history to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. King's work brought him to this city often. And in one sweltering August day in 1963, he addressed a quarter of a million people at the Lincoln Memorial. If American history grows from two centuries to 20, his words that day will never be forgotten. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. In 1968, Martin Luther King was gunned down by a brutal assassin. His life cut short at the age of 39. But those 39 short years had changed America forever. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 had guaranteed all Americans equal use of public accommodations, equal access to programs financed by federal funds, and the right to compete for employment on the sole basis of individual merit. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 had made certain that from then on, black Americans would get to vote. But most important, there was not just a change of law. There was a change of heart. The conscience of America had been touched. Across the land, people had begun to treat each other not as blacks and whites, but as fellow Americans. And since Dr. King's death, his father, the Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., and his wife, Coretta King, 
have eloquently and forcefully carried on his work, also his family have joined in that cause. Now our nation has decided to honor Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. by setting aside a day each year to remember him and the just cause he stood for. We've made historic strides since Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus. As a democratic people, we can take pride in the knowledge that we Americans recognized a grave injustice and took action to correct it. And we should remember that in too far too many countries, people like Dr. King never have the opportunity to speak out at all. But traces of bigotry still mar America. So each year on Martin Luther King Day, let us not only recall Dr. King, but rededicate ourselves to the commandments he believed in and sought to live every day. Thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, and I shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And I just have to believe that all of us, if all of us, young and old, Republicans and Democrats, do all we can to live up to those commandments, then we will see the day when Dr. King's dream comes true. And in his words, all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Thank you, God bless you, and I will sign it. Thank you, Mr. President, Vice President Bush, Majority Leader Baker, and the distinguished congressional and senatorial delegations, and other representatives who gathered here, and friends. All right-thinking people, all right-thinking Americans, are joined in spirit with us this day as the highest recognition which this nation gives is bestowed upon Martin Luther King, Jr., one who also was the recipient of the highest recognition which the world bestows, the Nobel Peace Prize. In his own life's example, he symbolized what was right about America, what was noblest and best, what human beings have pursued since the beginning of history. He loved unconditionally. He was in constant pursuit of truth. And when he discovered it, he embraced it. His nonviolent campaigns brought about redemption, reconciliation, and justice. He taught us that only peaceful means can bring about peaceful ends, that our goal was to create the beloved community. America is a more democratic nation, a more just nation, a more peaceful nation because Martin Luther King, Jr. became her preeminent nonviolent commander. Martin Luther King, Jr. and his spirit live in a, within all of us. Thank God for the blessing of his life and his leadership and his commitment. 
what manner of man was this. Make we, may we make ourselves worthy to carry on his dream and create the beloved community. Thank you. Thank you. Deep in my heart, I do believe Someday we'll all be free Someday we'll all be free I may not know how long it will be Someday we'll all be free Someday we'll all be free Someday Hold on my brother, give me your hand Someday we'll all be free, someday we'll all be free Learning to love, we'll find our way
Thank you very much.